Hi everyone, it's Jerry. There was a brilliant game played in round four of the 2013 FIDE World Cup between Gadakomsky, who was playing the white side, versus Shakriar Mamadiarov. Let's have a look at it. Komsky opened with e4. Mamadiarov played the Sicilian defense. Knight f3, e6, d4, the open Sicilian. And after knight c6 and queen c7, we have the Taimanov Bastrikov variation. f4. This is a common white pawn formation aimed at combating the small pawn center of black, consisting of d6 and e6. It looks to one day maybe play e5 to kick away a strong defensive piece on the king side, or even f5 to soften up the black pawn formation and try to get the e6 pawn to move so that the knight on c3 could hop into d5. D6, still, of course, the very early stage in the game, a lot of developing moves. And with this last one, since the knight on d4 is defended, queen f3 is permitted. Knight f6, queen f3, a6 stops knight b5 stuff, also looks to expand and inconvenience the knight on c3, maybe. Bishop d3, bishop e7, both sides castle, king to h1. Not a bad idea to get the king off of this potentially vulnerable g1 to a7 diagonal. There might be a nicely timed queen or bishop check that could hurt white. So it's not so clear how exactly the position will open up. And so uh, not, not a bad idea to get the king to a safer square. Uh, this f4 move and king h1 move, they tend to go hand in hand, uh, just as you would see when you fianchetto a bishop like g6, bishop g7. Uh, bishop d7 at first glance doesn't look to do much beyond connect the rooks. And you'll note from the nature of this position on the white side, uh, in an open uh, Sicilian on the white side, uh, black is the side who has less space and so will be perfectly all right with making some exchanges. And these knights uh, are not long off from being exchanged and this bishop will look to take up residence on this diagonal posting up on c6 soon enough. So rook on a to e1, this is the last piece to get involved for the white side, and as it stands, right now there is a lot of potential energy that has been built up behind this uh, pawn duo, this e4 and f4 duo, and these guys that are behind this pawn uh, duo will be set into motion soon enough. With either e5 or f5, any of these pawns being exchanged will free up one or two rooks, one or two bishops. So first b5 looks to kick this knight away. a3 stops that and you'll certainly want to think twice about making this type of move if the king resides on the queen side. If you had queen side castle you're just helping uh, black to open up the position so that they could get right at your king. Rook a to b8 b4 is on the cards, so that black could, after the exchange of the b and a pawns, look can, could, uh, could look to target b2. That never comes about, though. We have a lot of action taking place, a lot of direct moves occurring from here on out. Komsky first captures on c6 and then plays queen h3. Hitting at h7 directly, the bishop is, of course, there to hit at it direct indirectly. And it's important to know that you can't play queen h3 right away. Or in other words, you have to resolve this tension first, because if you play to h3 right away, black captures and then plays e5. The bishop sit, and so too is the queen. So you resolve that by first capturing on c6, kicking the bishop off of this diagonal, and then play queen h3. And now what to do about the pressure against h7? Um, you'll note that on the right-hand side, uh, the clocks, I don't know how accurate they are, but they do offer some insight as to how much time was spent on each of these moves. And the move that was decided on was rook on f to d8. It took about eight minutes to come up with that move. And what this move allows white to do is play to e5. And there's some serious pressure then on that h7 square. In fact, this e5 advance would be netting white some material. However, it's not a move that white went for. The move that uh, was decided on was bishop to d2, and quite a bit of time was spent on that, about 22 minutes. So why wasn't this particular move played, and why was the bishop playing to d2 instead of, let's say, c1, where it seems like it's safer? 
It's unprotected on D2 and potentially more vulnerable to the rook. We're going to have a look at those things because this is a very critical point in the game. Uh, a big, big turning point in the game right here. You could go for this advance. Let's see what would occur. Capture, capture, the queen has to take. The knight moves, crashing through on h7. And now, as white, you certainly don't go for this line. It looks a little bit scary, but the king, we're seeing the reason why this rook moved to d8. It's so that with this variation, the king is able to run away to e7. So we wouldn't have rook takes on f6, but we could certainly have bishop f4. The queen is hit, and when she moves, the rook is dead. For example, queen h5, the queens come off. White is up material. Why didn't Komsky go for this? Well, note the compensation that black has for being down the exchange. Well, black has a pawn. It's not just the exchange. Black has a pawn for it. Black also has the bishop pair. That adds value. And there's one other detail, at least that I'm seeing, and it's that this uh, black king could breathe a little bit easier. He's not going to get checkmated without the queens on the board. And so those things matter. And although white still stands better, it's not maybe so easy to convert this to a win. And in short, Komsky is looking for more. But I'm sure this is a position that he was trying to assess, and he uh, shied away from it. He went with something else. He didn't push e5. He played to d2. Why not to c1? We're going to see those reasons. Black's response first was d5. e5. Looks to kick the knight away. He has to post up on e5 and interfere with the bishop and queen's communication on h7. Knight e4 it is. This knight is immune from capture. Capturing the knight, well, it's actually black who is winning material. So not a road to go down if you're white. So if you're not going to capture the knight, what do you do? Well, you try to engage with the white pieces. You try to open the position up more and attack this king f5 strikes at e5 looks to peel open this f file all these pieces for white this uh, potential energy is now again set into motion with these exchanges and new possibilities are now present you'll note that with this f5 advance uh, this bishop could be taken and in the game it is but I want to point out first that this move queen takes e5 can be met in the following way. It could be met with knight takes knight, pawn takes knight, and now we're seeing a difference between the bishop being on c1 and d2. Being on d2, it could now take up a post on c3 with tempo, and this is a wonderful diagonal. Once the queen is uh, having to move, we could have f takes e, there is no time to take the bishop because of this uh, rook move, and this is dead for black, hitting at g7. The bishop's in a pin. There's no good solution for white at this point. Black wouldn't be capturing the bishop, but in short, we're seeing a difference. Um, we're seeing a very important detail, having the bishop on d2, a very important variation, I should, should say. By having the bishop on d2 opposed to c1, it allows for this particular response should uh, white go in for, or sh should black go in for this capture on e5. Now, if the bishop was playing to the c1 square at this point right here, how is it different? Well, after this exchange, knight e4, f5, queen takes pawn, knight takes knight, pawn takes knight, you don't have, you can't get the bishop on this diagonal, right? So maybe you have something like this, but this isn't leading to a whole lot. We're in an end game that's pretty much equal. Okay, a deficient pawn on e6, but this is going to be uh, very difficult to convert to a win. Um, so, just uh, well, very, very, very important detail between those particular squares, d2 and c1, and uh, all the more, all the more important because once you play to d2, it is more vulnerable. And in fact, in this variation that we see after now f5. White is allowing black to capture the bishop. So white's down a full minor piece. Let's see how white follows up. A great deal of uh, calculation was uh, made in this game. Very, very interesting stuff. It's f takes e, converging on f7, opening up this diagonal. Black has to do something about h7. That's the primary uh, threat. So the knight now 
drops back to e4, interferes with the communication again on h7. F takes, or excuse me, e takes f7. King to h8 was played. If you go to f8, you're in big trouble fast. The queen smashes through on h7. If something like this, you could take the knight. You could give a check. You could grab a pawn. You're now looking to promote with discovered check. Rook f8, and after one quiet move, rook to d1. How do you defend against queen to f6? Good luck with that. Can't do it. There wouldn't be a good solution from that variation. And so in short, king to h8 instead. And now we have knight takes on d5. White in this position is already down material and is investing more. Removing the defender of e4. The main trump for white is this bishop right here. White wants this bishop to be free to hit at h7 directly. So you remove a defender of the knight. Knight takes on d5, very forcing move. Queen, bishop, or hit. The bishop is there to recapture. And now how do you take the knight? Rook takes knight. Very cool stuff right here. Uh, we could have this variation where the bishop takes the rook, bishop takes bishop, but now again, how do you defend against this light square assault against h7? You could do something like g6, but that's not really a defense. This pawn is pinned. White still succeeds in crashing through on h7. So after rook takes e4, how do you defend his black? Well, what was played was g6. One pop quiz here is why not play something like bishop to g5, where the bishop could maybe come to h6 to defend against mate and secure some dark square blockade in a sense. If you'd like to, pause the video, see how white should respond. Okay, this is something you would uh, see in a tactical book. It's a mate in two. Queen takes pawn, rook h4, double check mate. That would be a cool finish, but black isn't going to allow that. So that's an important threat to see. So it's g6 that was played. And now, rook to f4. How to proceed from here? Well, we have king to g7, and this is probably the last uh, critical point for black here. Uh, white is able to generate one threat after another, and I think this is maybe the last chance for black to try to save this position. Instead of king to g7, we could have queen takes e5 allowing bishop takes g6 and the queen could then come back to g7 to try to defend this light square the bishop could then drop back looking for now rook g4 stuff but what black could be doing is try to set up a dark square uh, defense for the king with h6 meeting rook g4 with bishop g5 it's important if this position is to come about if you're on the white side you have to recognize what is the glue for black? What is holding everything together? Well, it's this structure right here, and it could be unstuck soon enough with queen h5 and h4, but I don't believe that there is anything more than a draw coming out of this particular variation where, well, it maybe even just queen takes here. I don't believe that uh, this game is going to end decisively. Uh, it looks to be, looks to be drawn. Um, so that's maybe a way that black could have proceeded instead of, in other words, instead of king to g7, queen takes on e5 and then dropping back to g7, but we didn't have that. Instead it was king to, king to g7, getting out of this pin, maybe allowing for this uh, h5 advance. And from here, after e6, the threat is to advance this pawn and then uh, pivot on this f7 square with queen h7 mate next just making a nothing move. This would be the main idea, to give a check, and then finally give a mate. So that's the threat, and uh, how does black defend against that? Well, of course it's not b4, it's rook to f8, not even allowing the pawn to move, not allowing white to pivot on f7, in other words. So what white looks to do now is simply get on this diagonal, this vulnerable diagonal that's pointing right towards the black king. Queen e3 observes two squares, d4 and e5. e5 is defended by the queen, so black has to address the threat of queen d4. Because if the king is in check, if the king is ever um, in check, he has to flee to this h6 square, and then that allows rook lifts maybe directly with rook h4 or timely rook f3 to h3 stuff. 
So after queen e3, it's bishop c5 watching over d4. But now the queen drops back. These retreating moves are very cool and very easy to overlook if you're playing the black side. From e1, she still keeps an eye on one of these, of these uh, four dark squares that she's trying to get to. She's observing uh, e5 as well as c3. <clears throat> and so we have now bishop to d6, hitting the rook. The rook gets out of the way on h4. And now there's yet another dark square black has to be concerned about. This uh, h6 square, if there could be a queen getting there, there's going to be big trouble. And soon enough, we have that threat coming about. Bishop e7, the rook is hit, but it's ignored. Queen e3, this rook could be captured. Well, what'll happen if it is captured? Let's have a look. Bishop takes. Queen gives check, king here, you grab the bishop with check, you come back here with check, and finally a rook up with the threat of coming over. The only defense is to grab the rook, and this is just going to be game over very fast for team black. So that's not a road to go down, or in other words, it's a good idea not to be capturing the rook in this position. The threat is queen h6, also queen d4, there's simply not a good solution for black at this point. What is tried is h5, but white, being down still a minor piece, is there to give up some more material. After queen d4 check, king h6, we have the very forcing queen takes h5. There are also other good moves. Queen to g4 with ideas of crashing through on g6, exploiting this pin. But uh, this is good enough, a very forcing move. Rook takes on h5, and it is at this point that black resigned. If pawn takes rook, we would have rook check. If the bishop captures, this is just mate on the spot. If king here, this is mate. And if uh, king here, we would have check and then mate on g7. So there's not really a good solution if the pawn captures the rook and if the king captures the rook, one quiet move, queen g7. Yet again, there's not a good defense against these light squares. g6 is coming under some fire. No good solution at this point. If something like rook h8, we could have this capture on g6. The king is running for his life. Bishop e2, white is insisting on getting to one of these light squares. It could only be defended for so long. Bishop g5, queen here. Again, at this point, no good solution to queen to g4 uh, mate happening very soon. So. Uh, as it stood in this game, very wild game, very good decisions made by Komsky. That e5 move, shying away from that and seeking more in the position. Very interesting tactical battle. A lot of potential energy built up, and we saw it set into motion. Uh, really, really cool game. Uh, I enjoyed it, and I hope you did too. So um, it was after this uh, point, after Rook takes pawn, that uh, Black resigned. So uh, that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care. Bye.